Welcome back to Business Fans. I'm your host, Michael Archer. Tonight, we are taking a close look at the yachting industry and its contributions to the economy here in Grenada. And I'm very pleased to have a very diverse panel here with us tonight on Business Files to explore that subject thoroughly. On my immediate left, Mr. Henry Joseph, well-known accountant, managing director, managing partner, Adam Foster. Next to him, Justin Evans, president of the Grenada Chamber of Industry and Commerce and himself involved in the marine business. And on further left, Mr. Lingham Samuel, economist and citizen. Gentlemen, welcome to Business Facts. Thank, Thank you for having us. Yeah. Last week, we had a very interesting discussion with the chairman of Campbell Nicholson. And we talked a lot about the Port Louis project and what they plan to do in the next phase around the Lagoon, the Lagoon as we know. I want to explore tonight the benefits of the yachting industry to the economy in Canada. I don't think that has been talked about enough. Henry, what do you see as the benefits to our economy of the yachting sector as a whole? If I may start with you. Thank you very much, Mr. Archibald. It is beyond doubt that the yachting industry is a known industry growing worldwide. Grenada, because of its situation, in a general way away from the hurricane belts, is therefore well placed to attract yachts. As a result, over the last, I would say, 10 or 15 years, a number of marinas have grown up in and around on Grenada. For those persons who are familiar, with a marinas, they would understand it that it's, I would say, very wealthy persons who get involved in yachting because it's a costly pastime. And there are not enough of marinas around the world that have satisfied the demand of all these yachtsmen because there are a lot of wealthy people and they are always looking for somewhere to go. Now, Camp Nicholson, as I understand it, are one of the world's renowned investors in the marina business. And I think for Grenada, they would do wonders. Because when you have a successful business that comes into a country, it tends to send a message to investors over there that that particular country is a good place in which to invest. So they would tend to attract other persons who have, I would say, reasonable funds that they want to invest in the country. So, in a general way, I would say that the coming into a being of a marina run by a camper, Abnogelson, would bring substantial benefits to Grenada. It would create um, jobs, it would help the farmers, and generally it would assist in attracting, as I say, additional investments into Grenada. All right, thank you. If I can move to Justin, let's get more specific. Okay. Uh, Henry talked about benefits. Let's get more specific. What? Name some of the benefits that you would expect because of your involvement <coughs> in the marine industry to have to see the Grenada benefit from with the investment by Camper Nicholson or any, any yacht in industry. Well, I'll, I'll start off specifically with the Camper Nicholson investment because, I mean, let's face it, that's why we're all here and, and discussing this. Um, Henry alluded to the Camper Nicholson name. And I think that's very important for us to understand because the Camper and Nicholson name in yachting is synonymous with, uh, you know, a Hilton, uh, a Marriott of Four Seasons in the hotel and hospitality industry. We're talking about a top-level name that says a certain thing about the product and quality of not only their product in Grenada, but Grenada itself. Um, <coughs> the other thing is that their their reach worldwide is phenomenal. Their marketing power is phenomenal. Um, I saw a figure that in 2008, Camper Nicholson spent close to 600,000 US dollars promoting its marina specifically in Grenada. That's not their advertising spend. That is their spend for Port Louis. That was Port Louis, um, the Camper Nicholson, sorry, Camper Nicholson's spend on advertising and marketing for that marina. And I'm going to put that in context. Uh, our spend on yachting from the Grenada Board of Tourism, because you know we are a resource-strained 
um, country at this time is 20,000 US dollars. So that gives you some idea of the work these people are doing for this particular industry. And I'm in the industry and we're feeling it. We're seeing the benefits. You know, our business is, is doing well, um, partly um, due to the fact that the yachting industry in Grenada, I think, has been a, a very well-run, um, well-managed business that has a very good reputation. Grenada has a good reputation among the yachting industry because it's safe, it's beautiful, it's well-known, its proximity to the Grenadines is very important, um, but also because Camper Nicholson has been really pushing this destination to a worldwide world market. Bingham, Henry talked about the fact that an investor like Camper Nicholson will attract other investors because they see it as a safe place. Justin talked about the advertising. Jobs. Let's talk about jobs. Well, Henry, uh, well, uh, Mr. Archibald, good night to viewers. The question of employment in Grenada is a very important one. The government of Grenada's statistics show that our unemployment rate borders at 30 percent. Mm -hmm. And 30 percent. As a small country, we are surrounded by water. We have some beautiful assets in terms of bays, in terms of uh, coral reefs, and other things that we can use to our benefit and to create opportunity for our people. When I was preparing to look at this whole issue of jobs and unemployment, I asked the Ministry of Education to give me some statistics of how many youngsters graduated from our schools, secondary schools, for the last five years. And 8,368 young persons graduated from our secondary schools over the last five years. It means approximately 1,674 of our kids have entered the job market. And what are the opportunities out there for them? There are not much. Agriculture, we speak about, provides some jobs, but are low paying jobs. The government service, the government is in no position to absorb more persons into its on its payroll because it currently has a $21 million a month payroll. The commercial sector, in many cases, are reaches limited because you know facing um, lower sales and cost of lower disposable income. So the question of creating jobs for our young people and opportunity really resides in us trying to use all the resources we have to the betterment of our people. And what I'm saying is that the amount of areas that have been identified that is that comes with the yachting sector are tremendous. I mean when you talk about electronics, refrigeration, and conditioning, the question of seals and mass and rigging and, and um, you know boat body and upholstery and carpeting and canvas and all this kind of stuff, which are generally much being much better paying jobs. Better paying jobs. Better paying jobs. Mm -hmm. I believe that these are things that we must explore. Can I uh, just jump in here on the on the job front? We did a study, um, well we didn't, the ECLAC, the European Commission for Latin American um, Development, did a study uh, that was published in 2004. In that study they got figures that put the direct employment by the yachting industry at a figure that was below 50. Now I, I think that was too low. I think that in 1998 that number was probably somewhere between 50 and 100, but we can't tell because we don't have the, the actual statistics. Last year, we did a, a count on the direct marine jobs in Grenada right now, the marine industry specifically. So businesses that are in the marine industry, their payrolls. I updated it today when I found out I was going on the show. I called around and updated a few businesses. That number is about 350 people. Okay, there are 350 Grenadians. That 50 that you talked about was when? The 1998. 1998. Yeah. So you're saying I, I think that's low, though. Yeah, I, but, yeah, but yeah. it was at that time 50 or 100. Yeah. And now we're seeing 300. 350. Right. Direct. Mm -hmm. I mean, that and that figure, we're not even sure that if they went with direct jobs. And now that's direct jobs. Yeah, what about business? indirect jobs? Well, indirect jobs is hard to tell. We have, we have estimated that it's probably around 200 or so. Now, I actually think it's higher. Because if you have 350 people working in an industry, and, and, and the important thing to remember about this is, I would say about 90% of the revenues from this business are foreign exchange. 
they are coming in hard currencies. They're coming in U.S. dollars, euros, British pounds, and, and you name it. Um, a very small part of this business is servicing our, our local fishing fleets and stuff like that, which is great. I mean, they enjoy a benefit. We enjoy the business. Um, it's good. But this is primarily a sector that is driven by foreign exchange. So these are 350 jobs that are being paid for from bank accounts outside of Grenada. This is not money Grenada needs to find to pay these individuals. So when this money comes in, um, you know, Mr. Jo Joseph is sitting next to me. He's our accountant. I don't know how many other marine businesses um, he covers. So there are accountants that probably, you know, there's probably the work in Grenada for a few accountants that could just work on the marine industry. Um, FedEx, you know, does a tremendous amount of money um, business in DHL. Uh, I mean, it, it just goes across the board. We have people coming in and out of our um, boat chart all day from various walks of life, you know, Huggins, um, tropical shipping. It just doesn't stop. It's, it's a business that is bringing in foreign exchange and it's spending it in Grenada. Well, as I indicated, it is beyond doubt that the marina business, and the yachting business, is a very high yielding industry. Um, from the statistics you gave, it is clear that the job creation increased sevenfold. In 10 years, there is no other industry in Grenada that has grown that much in such a short period. So what it clearly demonstrates is that that is the kind of industry that Grenada needs to attract. Yeah. Simply because we can create far more jobs than any other industry. And I think we're just scratching the surface. I mean, we, we, there are some issues that we're working on as, a, as an industry, um, but they have more to do with facilitation. They, they have more to do with, with, with breaking out down some um, bureaucratic barriers, um, clearance procedures between um, St. Vincent and Grenada, you know, things that don't take money, things that just take effort, time, and we're working on them and we're getting there. The government is being very helpful. Uh, this is a business that even though it's grown this much, and, and this, uh, this same study put the spend, the yachting spend in Grenada, $13 million back before 2004 a year. I would say that that number, I wouldn't be surprised if it is almost close to double that because in, at that time Antigua, four or five years ago, was $24 million. And I would, I, I would think Grenada is probably where Antigua was four or five years ago. Nick Myers made an interesting observation. He divided the spend into two. Mm -hmm. He said there was spend by the boats themselves, mm -hmm. right? The boat needed new sails or riggings, whatever the boat needs, and uh, uh, groceries, oil, whatever. And then spending by the captains and the guests on the boat as they move around the country, whether they take a taxi, whether they go to the grocery, etc. And he divided it into two, two years, and each of them in his mind was exceeding $20 million US. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I absolutely would not be surprised. Mm. Um, uh, what we see happening is that there's another dimension that I've seen happen with the yachting industry is that it had afforded opportunity for um, for example a taxi driver who has now created a product right of a kind of village based community based tourism in which he gathers a whole set of yachties uh, sometimes 40 50 of them bring them into a village setting and then uh, they like for example, go through the motions and the activity of doing, for example, a local oil dump mm -hmm. in a rural setting. Mm -hmm. The villagers come out and they interact on a one-on-one -on -one in a very personal way, mm -hmm. right? Um, obviously, they buy the whole, they buy the shop, they buy all the bears, <laughs> they buy the rums, um, they sample some of the local products and so on, and they get a different experience. Right, so that is also lending a hand to diversifying our tourism product. Exactly. You know, you know, many years ago, I remember when I was a little boy, I won't say how long what I was. <laughs> the yacht in the Grenada was, was known, was a premier destination for yachts. Mm -hmm. Still is. And, but we, we lost it over some, uh, we did some things wrong, and the yacht stopped coming. Mm -hmm. Let me just right. intervene with that. Um, Grenada did a master plan for the tourism sector in 1997. Mm -hmm. And if I could just read you a line that it says, and relates to that. I would want to come right back to that. Just give me, give us a moment, take it a break for our sponsors. Business Files, will you back? Welcome back to Business Files. 
We were talking to Henry Joseph, Justin Evans, and Lingham Samuel, and we were discussing the yachting industry and its contributions to the possible contributions to the economy of Grenada. And Lingham, you were referring, you were referring directly to a tourism master plan in 1997. I, yes, I, uh, I had sight of the master plan for the tourism sector, which was done in 1997. And very interesting, it said the following. There is an acknowledged shortage of first-class marine facilities in Grenada. That was said back in 1997. As it relates to the lagoon, it went on to say, the largest facility at the lagoon in St. George's, which was the center of a thriving yachting business years ago, so it acknowledges history, and has been in a state of degradation for several years. This is what it said. We're talking about 1997. It said, and it went on to say, the complete development of this facility is critical to the future growth of the yachting sector in Grenada. Government should take some initiatives to facilitate the redevelopment of a first-class facility at the Lagoon. That is back in 1997. Mm -hmm. Sounds prophetic, isn't it? Yeah, so we're now seeing that happening. And we want to make sure that that project, in fact, goes through the next phase. Just the types of spend. Yeah. Is the spending restricted? Sometimes you hear in some sort of tourism projects the people, the, the, the tourists or the visitors spend in particular areas. But in the case of the yachting industry, the question I have in my mind is the spending restricted to certain areas or is it spread across various sectors and various groups? It's spread across. I mean, we've gotten some, we're doing a study right now and we've got some preliminary, we? the Marine and Yachting Association of Grenada. And in, in, in conjunction with that, the Board of Tourism is doing a study and, and, and we plan on getting together to share our results and, and work together. So by the end of the year, we have a really comprehensive picture of, of, of the impact of the yachting industry in Grenada. Um, however, what we found is that on average, the yachts you see with people on them anchored are spending about 12,000 EC dollars a month in Grenada. Out of that $12,000, about 50% of it is being spent on non-marine related items such and as, businesses such as food and drink, mm -hmm. um, provisioning for the boats, gas, um, and you know other utilities. Um, they're going on tours, as as you mentioned. Uh, anything you can imagine. Some of these other services, they're having items FedExed in. Uh, they're paying government um, charges. They're you know port charges. Uh, cruising permits. Some of them are, are, are leaving their boats here flying out. They're paying our departure taxes. They're helping us with airlift. You know, this is an industry that is that is additive. It's not a or. You know, it's not either or. This is an and. Um, the other thing we found, which which I, I find it is very interesting, is that the people we have polled, 50% of them are on their third or greater visit to Grenada. So they, they keep returning. They keep returning. So these are people that when we put the effort and spend the money to bring them here, we're not just doing it once. They're coming back again and again and again. 25% of them were on their more than sixth visit to Grenada. I mean, that's phenomenal. That's great. And that's exactly what we need. Um, it, you know, Liam was mentioning uh, GYS in the lagoon. We've been here before. Grenada used to be the linchpin of the the southern Caribbean yachting scene. There was Antigua and there was Grenada and the charter market and, and yachting went between the two. Um, you know, we talk about opportunity for our young people. There are about, you know, three or four Grenadians that I know of right now that are captains on yachts, captains on yachts over a hundred feet. What does a captain like that? Yeah. Well, one Grenadian. I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to uh, get him in trouble in case he's supposed to be paying taxes. But he's on a he's on a yacht that's about 150, 160 feet long, a beautiful yacht. And I would gather that he is probably making about a 15, 15 to 20 thousand U.S. dollars a month. That's a lot of money. I think so. Let me, um, let me assure you. <laughs> that he does not have to pay any taxes because his income is not earned in Grenada. No, I know, I know, I'm kidding. But, but someone could argue that that is just three or four guys. What about 
captains or people working on the boats at a lower level? Are they, are they, is their income reasonable also? It's very good. I mean, the, the, the deckhands and so on, those boats are making 2,500, 3,000 US dollars a month. You know, there is opportunity for our young men and women to, to become crew. Um, one of the businesses that's looking into coming to Grenada wants to come in and train um, yacht crew. You know, you have to start, you start at a very basic level, you know, there are, you, you see these crews on, on these boats and they're polishing and, you know, they're from Australia and South Africa and England, the United States, they're all from all over the world and, and they work their way up. You know, you mentioned three or four guys that I can think of that are, are captains. Well, there's, there's more than captains. There, there are guys in Antigua that's, that are Grenadians that started here because of GYS. One of them owns his own restaurant and hotel in Antigua now. You know, he started working on a yacht. He could cook, just, you know, being a Grenadian, he could cook well. He ended up being the chef. And now he owns his own, you know. This is an industry where the sky's the limit. You know, in Grenada, we have to stop looking at, this, at industries and, and imagining ourselves on the bottom. We have to start looking at industries and saying we may have to start at the bottom, but, you know, we can be the captains, we can be the owners, we can, we can do these things. And the first thing we need to do, though, is get these industries here. Henry, looking at the economy as a whole, is going through a very difficult period. Nobody could raise funds. We had five projects that are at a standstill. Not because something Grenada did wrong, but because the, the entire world economy and the financial markets died. But we have one that seems to be able, they have the way with them, to move on to the next phase. Should we be doing everything to make sure they move on? And that that phase continues? Well, as I indicated, yachting or the people involved in yachting are wealthy. Mm -hmm. Certainly that's the kind of tourist Grenada wants to attract. I also indicated that Camper Nicholson, if not the number one, is very much the top in the yachting business. By they coming to Grenada, if I had the opportunity to be in government, I would give them every possible assistance to ensure that they remain here. In fact, as I understand it, the investment that they will be having there could quite easily be a hundred million EC dollars. The number of jobs they are going to be creating would be tremendous. And as was said, over 1,800 students graduate from our secondary schools on an annual basis. How many jobs have we been creating? Very little. So we have to find ways of ensuring that we do not continue to have this brain drain that's been occurring year after year after year. We have to create jobs locally, get our people to stay here so our country can um, develop. We don't want everyone having to run to the United States or to St. Lucia where I'm yachting is also big. I'm grinning, I can't do it in itself. So as a result, I would give Camp and person every possible assistance in order that that industry could really grow and flourish. And I'm sure that once they get the assistance that's unnecessary, within five years, they would make a tremendous difference to our economy. But even more so, um, Kama Nicholson, based on his history and his profile in the art industry in the world, is a blue chip phenomenon. Yes, yes, yes. And we have to make that work for us. Um, for too often, we sometimes see uh, foreign investment in a line that is unintelligent, I would say. We have to be going to realize that we need foreign investment. We need to create jobs. And once we realize that, it means that we have to create an enabling environment and we have to do so sensibly. It is not to say that we will give away our bot right. By all means, we should defend our bot rights. But we must understand that in the world of business, there are balances that need to be struck and win win situations that can be achieved if you win win situations. That if you are doing so sensibly. Mm -hmm. If you are doing so sensibly. And that starts from government policy right down to how the average man in the street treats with a foreign investor or foreign investment. Okay. And I'd what, like what? to I add, this is not, in addition to the foreign investment, this is all also about earning foreign exchange. 
this is an industry that is is bringing us hard currency you know a lot of the detractors from from various industries you know, I, I still see them driving imported cars I, I still see them buying imported items you know where do where do they think the the exchange comes from to be able to buy those items we're a, we're an island that has to import a lot yeah. and as as a result we have to generate foreign exchange and you know it, it's it's this is not something that we're taking out of pockets of Grenadians this is coming in from outside right it allows Grenadians to save because they don't have to be spending to to um, hold up these jobs hopefully it'll enable Grenadians to start investing more in their own businesses and so so they can take better advantage of this we need to expand this economy by adding foreign exchange to it that's how you expand your GDP you, you either you have to expand your money supply and if you can expand your money supply by bringing in other people's money it's Maybe a lot better, better. Yeah. You know, I can understand a certain amount of skepticism because we have had some real scams pass through <laughs> the in the past and claim that they were the foreign investors. But this particular company that we keep touching on has an excellent reputation. Yeah. All that you can find out about them suggests that they, they were their high reputation, well reputed, and in fact that they do their best to ensure that your heritage and anything that we want to protect is protected. And they gave examples of it in the last discussion we had. So it seems to me, speaking purely for myself, that we need to ensure this particular investor stays in Grenada and moves on to, to the next phase. Um, I understand government is in the process of drawing up a comprehensive plan that will align to foreign investors where, where we want them, the priority areas, areas that are reserved for Grenadians, etc. What the concessions, etc. Well, that's, that's a new investment act. Right. right. So, it, how yes. far along is that, Henry? You know? That should have gone to Parliament already. I have not followed it that closely, but if it hasn't, I am sure the new investment act will be in force by September. Yeah. I think that is vital. It paints exactly to the foreign investor. This is what we want. This is what you can get. This is where you cannot go. But what I, it does I, I, is, I, I, so all it makes it certain, it makes it certain, there yeah. won't be any doubt right. that if you are investing in a particular industry, you will get X amount of concessions. There will be no secret deals, mm -hmm. right? And of course, due diligence would be done, right? Checks and balances, so that you know when you have agreed that a particular investor will be given a license to operate, that that investor is above board, can find his own financing and we do actually what he says, right? And, and Grenada would not be in a position where they would have to guarantee loans and find themselves two or three years and later having to find taxpayers' money mm -hmm. to repay yeah. those loans. I'm, I'm, like I'm, I'm, concern, I'm concerned about also making sure that inside there we spell out what are the, what are the various licenses that are needed and various permissions. I assume all of that would be. Everything necessary. is well spelled out. It's a very comprehensive document. Just say. Well, Henry and I both also sit on the, the board of the GIDC, and, and the GIDC is, it, it already was that, but it, it is being um, kind of revamped to also assist with that with foreign investors. And I'd also like to, to point out a, a nice thing about this Reinvestment Act is it's a, it's a level playing field. Because it applies to Grenadians too. It applies so, so to Grenadian the same thing investors. That applies to the same, the uh, same concessions. Granted to absolutely. Foreign investors will be an investor is an investor. Right. Okay. Um, you know. Okay. So I think that's a, a very gentlemen. Nice we have to take a pause for our sponsors. Business finance will be right back. Welcome back to business finance. We have been talking to Henry Joseph, Justin Evans, and Lingam Samuel about the yachting industry and its contributions to the economy of Grenada. I want to talk about. Um, linkages to other sectors, Justin, such as agricultural or fisheries. Um, when these yachts come in, I'm making the assumption that there's also spending that links back to these other sectors. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we could take the most dramatic um, example, which is the, the large mega yachts that we've been seeing in the lagoon over the past year. I mean, one of those boats will come in and spend some ridiculous amount of money, you know, thousands of US dollars on cut flowers, um, fresh fish, uh, fresh fruits, fresh vegetables. Yes, it's true that they do provision um, a lot of the time in you know, St. Martin when they start heading south, but when they get here, they have to replenish things. So they go to our supermarkets, but 
what's better than, than that is their charter guests, they don't want fish that has been caught two weeks before and it was bought in a, in a supermarket in Florida. They want fresh fish. They're in Grenada. They want fresh caught um, tuna, you know, grouper and so from Grenada. They want to sample our, our fruits that are indigenous. They want to sample our vegetables. Um, so, you know, they are spending, they spend a large amount of money. I've heard anecdotal tales of, you know, some of these um, crews going to a food fair and so on and, and spending, you know, $10,000 on food, just filling up, you know, uh, carts and carts of, of food, you know, buying whole fish. Uh, you know, it, 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 the, the spending is, is tremendous and it, and it goes right to our fishermen, our farmers, right? Our people who are growing um, flowers, you know, Grenada has a great reputation for its flowers. We do well in the Chelsea Flower Show. They know that. When they come here, they want those flowers. They want those flowers in their boats. Um, so it's, it, it really, there's some very direct linkages. <coughs> Lingam, what about the physical developments that we see from a company such as um, same company. Well, if we've been honest with ourselves, um, and we look a couple of years back, what the lagoon was, right? Um, certainly Mr. Lincoln Ross really did not have a pristine <laughs> surrounding of the, of the lagoon, and we have to be absolutely frank about that. Um, what we have seen since the developments that when the Purdue project is that there has been a lot of directs has been moved uh, a lot of debris has been removed from the lagoon. The lagoon looks better now than it did before, right? The fact of the matter is that we have to admit that a tremendous job has been done to clean up the lagoon. Obviously, there's so much, there's much work to be done, but I could only see a credible international company like that doing its best to maintain the environment in the way that it should. Right? And I think that has uh, been an enormous plus for us. And um, I think as a nation, we must recognize that. Right? Uh, and any honest Grenadian who is worth their salt is, will acknowledge that. Right? And I could, as I said before, I could only see it getting better. Right? Well, we have to be, of course, we have to be vigilant and we have to be ensure that things are done that does not unnecessarily stroke the sensitivities of our population. And create a discord that we oh, we don't need, we don't need, and therefore we have to address these issues sensibly and in balance. No, I wanted to point out that the trickle down effect was, as was indicated, a passenger on a yacht spends on average, and that's per person, twelve thousand dollars on a trip. Who benefits, right? The taxi drivers, because you won't spend 24 hours on that yacht for the seven days, or even though it's two days you're spending in Grenada, you won't spend all the time on, on the yacht. So the taxi drivers would benefit. The farmer, because he has to supply fruits and vegetables, right? The supermarkets, our food fairs, and our, you know, our whatever. So the benefit cannot be taken um, lightly. One has to understand that, and I just want to reiterate the point that the person who takes a trip on a yacht is not by any means um, someone who is short of funds. And there are a lot of these persons in the world, and they're becoming more and more, because we know what has happened throughout the world. And granted, the downturn has affected it, but you still have a large number of people who are involved in the yachting business and they are spending money. And I'd also like to add, you know, I think there's a, a little bit of a misperception in Grenada that um, while the, the visitors that come on these yachts might be foreigners, a lot of the businesses in the marine sector are Grenadian owned. Two of the biggest businesses, I would say four actually, the biggest businesses in this industry are owned by Grenadians. It's Grenada Marine, Spice Island Marine, Island Water World, Budget Marine. You know, these are all um, big companies that are Grenadian owned and are benefiting from this. They're employing people. Our Spice Island Marines, um, uh, our employment has surged in the past few years. We're, we're growing, we're adding jobs. 
You know, so and that is a result of the fact that the yachting industry has been growing. Yeah, the, the the yachting industry. You know, there there's there's good things being done in Grenada. The addition of a Capra and Nicholson to that is is just it's like throwing fuel on a fire. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good yeah. way to put it. It's you know, we're we're doing we're doing well. However, this is you know. With the addition of a camper and Nicholson, Grenada's natural beauty, its proximity to the Grenadines, its um, location south of the hurricane belt, you know, Grenada is just perfectly poised to be a yachting powerhouse. But we have to, first of all, allow it to happen. There are things that need to be done to facilitate it, right? But you know, no one is asking the government of Grenada or the Grenadian people for investment. These these projects are being done with with private funds. Um, you know, the government is supporting it. It's a it, it's a good story. I, I I really don't understand how it's become well, how do controversial. Answer, how do we answer the charges that you keep hearing on the television? Let me be devil's advocate for okay. a moment. Well, let's hear some of the charges. Some of the charges that um, they we're giving away our heritage. That these people are coming and moving us on off of our little green space. And this is a green space that all our families used to be on, etc. How do you answer those charges? Well, and the fishermen have been here for the last hundred years and we just come and throw them off. Well, let me ask you a question. I mean, uh, you know, we had spoken earlier and I, I, I'm, I think a lot of people are hesitant to, to get into this. However, you know, I've, I've heard some of these charges and I'm having a hard time, right, looking at the reality of what I see on the lagoon and what I'm hearing. You know, I drive down along the lagoon, I don't see this level of activity that some of these groups are speaking about. I see a couple fishing boats that are sitting there that don't move a lot, which would indicate there's not a lot of fishing going on by the people who own them. I see those same guys hanging around a lot by those boats. To me, that area does not look like a park. If, if, this, if this argument, and we're talking about heritage, what is our heritage, right? Is our heritage that five, six fishing boats need to be left in one spot and, and we cannot have a reasonable discussion and say, look, we understand this isn't pleasant. However, you know, you guys are going to have to move to here to facilitate 50, 100, 200 Grenadians getting jobs. Well, you know what? That is a trade-off. I personally, as a Grenadian, as someone who has to provide jobs, who has to look at these young people landing on the side of the road without jobs, that's a trade-off I'm willing to make. Okay. And I'm, betting, I'm, willing to bet, I'm willing to bet that it's a, a, a trade-off a lot of Grenadians are willing to make, and they're just being quiet. And there's a, a very loud minority making a lot of noise. Now, I'm not going to get into the, I, the, the whole issue of cottages on the lagoon, so that's, that's personal preference. Um, you know, I, I don't want to even go there. If this is about turning that into a park, I'm all for it. Let's let's have a beautiful park there. But let's be realistic. It's not a beautiful park now. All right. Make your view on this. <clears throat> My view on this is that um, let us step back a bit in history and see what the lagoon was and what it is now. And the whole build up to actually having a ring road around the lagoon. I recall as a youngster, um, the lagoon used to go a little man. And it was all backfilled and there was garbage and all kind of things that eventually evolved over time and which you have a ring going around in the lagoon. Right? I, I am not from that area so I do not know a lot of the, the history of the area. But my observation is that the lagoon has been, has had a, a kind of topsy-turvy evolution over time. And it actually was taken over by what are considered to be negative influences and I pointed out a while ago that Mr. Ross's um, operation by no means could have been deemed to be part of our heritage. If anybody is to say so, it would be to me a hypocritical statement and a ludicrous statement. Now, going forward, what is required? There are some fishermen who inhabit the lagoon. There are people who have boats, some of those are pleasure boats. There are some derelict boats high up in the lagoon. The place needs to be cleaned up. Our heritage is not based on filth. Our heritage is not based on keeping things um, less than what we accept as standards in our various homes and the way we keep ourselves as people. 
it does not represent that. I do not, I do not accept that that is our heritage. Right? I do not accept that. However, there are some people who have legitimate concerns. One of the concerns that has sparked this whole discussion has been the question of the, uh, the um, cottages in the lagoon. I, for one, concur with the government's position and the, re the recent declaration by the Prime Minister that there will be no cottages in the lagoon. So that matter, as far as I'm concerned, closed. So we have to move on from that. Is there a case for further cleaning up the lagoon? Certainly there is. Is there a case for improving the overall aesthetics of the lagoon edge? There is. Is there a case for um, making the place more acceptable visually in terms of you know its aesthetics and the conditions it has and so on? There is. And therefore, um, I believe that some sensible give and take between the parties, whatever they may describe themselves to be defenders of our heritage, but you cannot argue with me that, you are, that our heritage is premise on filth, on less than desirable standards in maintenance of our environment, on garbage, and derelict, derelict boats being left in the lagoon, and all of the things that we have seen that have been cleaned up, in, have been cleaned up since this whole um, investment started. And I believe that um, while I have no particular brief for Mr. Desabri, but one would say that the initiatives have been taken as in fact improved the general conditions of the lagoon. And we have to be frank about that. I don't think that could be argued. Right? Where there are situations where people may have felt that we did not, the former administration did not um, go about it properly, or we were um, in a very weak negotiating position. Part of the problem that we face in relating to foreign direct investment is that when you do not run your house very well and you find yourself facing a situation where you have a debt, public debt to GDP of 108 percent and where unemployment is 30 percent, you are in a you are in a very uh, Emmy, let me give you the last say. Yeah. We have come to the end of uh, what I think is a very interesting discussion. Emmy, let me give you the last. So, so I think one has to accept that there is a price that has to be paid for development. It is beyond doubt that the campus Nicholson Group are going to develop that a marina, which 40 years ago no one wanted to even pass by because of the state it was in. That situation has changed and it's going to improve. So what is the price we are prepared to pay? I would believe that if we are going to be displacing three or even six boats and the crew, that would be a small price to pay for a development of over a hundred million dollars. So from where I sit, I would give a project like this all the support I can because it's going to benefit Grenada in the final analysis. We will create jobs, our farmers will benefit, our taxi drivers, our supermarkets, and everyone else. So I would say that's a miracle. Gentlemen, on behalf of my viewers, the viewers of Business Fire, we thank you for giving of your time. I thought it was a very interesting, a very revealing and valuable discussion. Business Files, we'll be right now. Welcome back to Business Files. This is a segment in which I get to speak my mind, and I will do so tonight. We are approaching 30% unemployment. We have an economy that is on a downward spiral, and we don't know when we will see a turnaround. We desperately need jobs for our people. And we have five projects that have been stalled because of the world economic recession. We must not let this present project at Port Louis be stalled. Grenada needs foreign direct investment. I can understand a certain amount of skepticism because of the scams that we had here posing as investors in the past. But Campbell Nicholson has a reputation as an international, well-reputed company. And they have demonstrated in my mind a willingness to keep their word and to work with us. I do not agree with the idealists who say 
we must not have foreign investment in this country and things must remain exactly as they are. Neither do I agree with those who say, yes, we will accept foreign investment, but then turn around and make the conditions for the environment so strict or so uncomfortable that it does not attract any foreign investment whatsoever. The Grenada was the center of the yachting industry in the southern part of the Caribbean years ago. It provided jobs of all levels, highly paid. It was connected to various parts of the of our, our various sectors of our industry. We need to return Grenada to the pinnacle it had before as far as the yachting industry is concerned. And we now have an opportunity to do so. And we have an opportunity to do so with a reputable company. The government needs to close this deal so that Camper and Nicholson can move forward with that project and create the necessary jobs for our people, create the spending of foreign, foreign currency in our country, allow the fishermen to benefit, allow the farmers to benefit. That is my opinion. We need to ensure that that particular project moves forward. And with that, we close our files for this week. But before I go, I would like to read you something from Mahatma Gandhi. He says, you must not lose faith in humanity. Humanity is like an ocean. If a few drops are dirty, the ocean itself does not become dirty. I am Michael Archibald. And good night to you from Business Files.